All right. So intention, intention to be legally bound by the agreement. Um, it is often called intent to create legal relation. And then there is certainty, uh, certainty as to the terms of the agreement. And the third requirement that we are going to uh, briefly touch upon is capacity. So um, capacity to contract. Um, this course does not talk a lot about capacity. It just briefly touches upon um, capacity of minors. So we're, we're just going to uh, briefly mention it today. And later on, after a couple of lectures, um, we will discuss uh, capacity in a little bit of detail, but not much. Okay. All right. So let's uh, start our discussion on certainty. So this for uh, this section of certainty deals with uh, cases where the parties have used ambiguous or unclear language. Okay. So this section first deals with the cases where the language is unclear or is ambiguous, and then looks at cases where the parties have deliberately left the terms to be agreed at a, at a later date. Okay. Now, in the former cases, the agreement is, is often described as vague agreements, as you can see on the left-hand side of the diagram. And uh, on uh, about the uh, latter case, it is described as incomplete, incomplete agreements. Uh, so basically, uh, you should not worry about separating these two types uh, in your mind because the cases on vagueness, when the terms are vague or ambiguous, always shade into incompleteness. Um, let me give you an example. If an agreement is vague about the price, let's say, um, so the agreements are, are is agreement is vague and terms are uh, ambiguous as to the price to be paid. Then, it, in reality, uh, it is an incomplete agreement as well, right? It is incomplete as it lacks a term specifying the price. Now, by contrast, an agreement can be incomplete without being vague if the parties agree to come to an agreement on a latter day. So, such a contract is basically clear on the face of it um, how the price should be determined by the by the uh, by agreement of the parties, but as we will see later on in, in this lecture, the courts are reluctant to enforce such an agreement unless there is a mechanism included in the in the terms. So a mechanism for completing the agreement in the event that parties do not come to a conclusion or in, in the event that parties fail to agree on the price. So we will see all of these cases in this lecture. Okay. Uh, with regard to vague agreements, you need to keep two things in mind. Uh, the role of the courts. So you have to, you have to think that role of the court um, is, not, is not to create terms of a contract, right? Their, what is their role? Their role is to interpret a contract, right? But they cannot, they cannot uh, construct a contract. They cannot create a contract. So that's not their role. And if the terms are vague they, uh, and they, are, they cannot be determined with certainty, then there is no contract for the courts to interpret. So keeping that in mind, you have to look at the cases on vague agreements. And our main case in this section is Scammell versus Austin. <clears throat> So Scammell and uh, Nephew versus Alston, and it was deci decided in 1941. In this case, the buyer, uh, if you look at the facts, uh, the buyer purchased a lorry with the price to be paid on higher purchase terms. Now, what are higher purchase terms? That was the exact question that courts discussed. Now, so uh, the buyer purchased that lorry. Um, with the price to be paid on higher purchase terms over two years. The problem mainly centered on the meaning of the higher purchase terms. The House of Lords held that the agreement was uncertain and therefore the contract argued for was basically void. And void means that it did not exist. Um, 
So one of the judges conceded that in some cases it is possible, basically it is possible to imply the terms that would explain what higher purchase terms are, but in this specific instance, in this specific case, it was impossible to do so. So that was the opinion of one of the judges. And he thought that the words had such a wide range uh, of possible meaning that it was impossible to arrive at a single one. So that is your main case for vague agreements, where you derive the rule that um, that the contract is basically void if the, it did not exist at all, if the terms were vague. <clears throat> now it is useful to compare the case that we just discussed, Scammell versus Austin, with Gila and Company Limited versus Arcos. Again, uh, look at the facts of the case on the slide and pay attention to the highlighted word, highlighted phrases. So. In this case, an agreement to buy and sell timber contained uh, two important terms, and those two important terms are in red in the in the facts of the case on the slide. Okay, so the first term was that buyer would buy 22,000 standards of pair specification. Now pay attention to the words pair specification, and <clears throat> so. Um, does anyone know what does it mean, fair specification? Actually, that is exactly what the courts were uh, arguing on, that what does fair specification actually mean? So it was, um, they thought that it, it was a vague, uh, a vague phrase. And the second term, was that buyer was granted an option to buy 100,000 standards. Now buyer um, tries to exercise their option. What option were they trying to exercise? The option to buy 100,000 standards in the second term. And when they tried to exercise their option, they found out that sellers did not have any timber to sell and buyers sued for breach of option. Now there was a lot of debate centered on the meaning of 100,000 standards. It was a vague term, but it was debated whether um, uh, courts could uh, put a meaning to it, okay? And uh, whether the courts could imply terms explaining what is actually meant by 100,000 standards. Now the House of Lords accepted that the agreement was complete and binding. Um, in contrast to Scammell versus Outson. So in this case, the House of Lords accepted that the uh, agreement was complete and binding. Lord Tomlin thought that the option implicitly referred to 100,000 standards of fair specification, like the first term of the sale of 22,000 standards of fair specification. So they compared the uh, 100,000 standards with the first, uh, with the first batch of timber, 22,000 standards. Okay, um, so this, they said that it, it is implied that they are talking about the same kind of standard, even though it did not expressly say so. Uh, he also thought that the meaning of fair specification was itself vague, although it was again possible to imply a meaning to make it sufficiently certain on the basis that the parties must have attributed some meaning to fair, fair, uh, sorry, fair specification because they had performed the first term relating to the sale and purchase of 22,000 standards of, of fair specification. So um, in simpler words, by accepting the first batch of the timber, the buyer must have accepted that it was of fair specification and therefore attributed a meaning to this term, fair specification. And Lord Tomlin also looked at the evidence of how the timber trade is, is conducted, um, so that he could imply a specific meaning to the phrase fair specification. So, two important points in this case. How, how this case is different from the one uh, we previously discussed. The contract, the contract was already performed upon, so they had already accepted 22,000 standards of uh, of timber. 
so courts were um, took the opportunity courts took the opportunity and applied the same meaning of fair specification to the next batch of 100000 standards right and the second thing they looked uh, at was the general trade like how the general business of timber is conducted to find the meaning of that specific term which was considered vague on the face of it okay so we discussed the two main cases of vague agreements uh, under the under the main heading of certainty uh, so there here's a small activity for you what do you think is the difference between the decisions in hillas and scamels are there convincing reasons for deciding these cases differently So what would you say? Um, who would like to start first? I, I would need a volunteer to start. Um, okay, so Jennifer is saying that in Hillas, the court was able to infer the intentions of the parties. Okay, so why were they able to infer the intentions in this case and not in Scammell versus Alton? Okay, Jeremy is saying that in Hillas, there uh, had already been performance against a prior part of the contract. Whereas in uh, Scamble versus Outson, that was not the case. And they had already um, accepted the first batch. So they applied the meaning of uh, th that the same meaning to the next batch. Very good, Jeremy. <clears throat> Yesha is saying that if they agreed to perform the contract, then they must have understood some intention of the of the buyer. So it, uh, Yesha's comment also relates to Jeremy's comment. So again, it uh, it talks about the performance of the contract. But remember that uh, most of the actually all of the cases that go into court are um, you know some kind of uh, contract. One of one or the other party performs the contract and that's why the dispute arises right so there is some kind of a performance in every every kind of contract okay bash is saying that in villa they were able to use common commercial practice very good so that was another difference another difference between the facts of the case Okay, so Sandeep is saying that inference drawn in Hillas appears to be logical. However, the first one appears to have ended abruptly. Sandeep, do you think they did not? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get your, I, I do not understand the last part of your sentence. Can you explain it a little bit more? <clears throat> hmm. So Sandeep, you, uh, Sandeep is saying because the analysis leading to the conclusion in the first one just said that the contract was just not there. Um, right, and and Sandeep, uh, Sandeep, you think that judges should have tried to or should have, you know, applied the same uh, logic to Scamel that they applied in Hillas? Now, point to think is that why, why did they not apply the same, why did they not use the same logic in Scamel? So you need to see the difference between the facts. First difference is that in Hillas, they, they had already accepted the first batch, and they were judges were able to apply the uh, meaning of fair specification 
that was used in the first batch of 20,000 uh, standards, they, they took the same meaning and applied to uh, the 100,000 standards. So, so that was the main difference between the facts. Okay, so Jennifer is saying that camel, there was too much uncertainty. Yes. Um, yes. So Jennifer is saying there was too much of uncertainty about what could have meant by higher purchase agreement. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So there has to be, there was too much uncertainty. There was no way. Uh, remember one of the justices said uh, that in some contracts it is, it is possible to apply a meaning or to imply a meaning uh, of higher purchase. But in that specific uh, case, there was there was too much uncertainty, and it was just not possible to come uh, come up with one meaning. And he said that higher purchase could mean many things. And in some contracts, depending on the case, uh, sorry, depending on the facts of the case, it is possible to uh, come up with just one meaning. But in that case, camel, it was uh, not possible. Casey. Okay, yeah, Casey is saying that it's not the role of the courts. It's not the role of the courts to uh, create a contract or create a term, right? Absolutely. But in some cases, such as Hillas, uh, when the opportunity arises, such as uh, contract has been per there has been a performance on the contract already, uh, if they can apply the same terms to the next term to the second term or if they can look at the general trade conduct, then they take the opportunity and they apply that meaning to the term. And uh, so basically, Casey, you're right. It, that's a general rule that it's not their role. But in some cases, such as Hillas, they, they, do, they do imply a meaning. All right, so very good, good discussion. Okay. Now, uh, there are uh, some recent examples of apparently vague terms being treated as sufficiently certain in courts of appeal. So the low-cost uh, low flights industry uh, provides us with these recent examples. And if you see, uh, if you look at the, if you read these cases, you will see that apparently the terms are vague. Uh, but they were treated as sufficiently certain in the Court of Appeal. So the first case is Durham, uh, Durham Tees Valley Airport versus BMI Baby, 2010. The court found in favor of the airport that a promise by the airline to establish a two-based aircraft operation for 10 years at the airport was not void for uncertainty, even though this did not impose a liability to operate a specific number of flights. So they were able to put um, a meaning to the phrase two based aircraft operation. And in the second case, Jet2.com versus Blackpool Airport, and this is a very recent case, was decided in 2012, uh, it was the airline that won. The Court of Appeal found that a promise by the airport to Use their best endeavors to promote Jet2.com's low-cost services, and use all reasonable endeavors to provide a, co a, a cost base that will facilitate Jet2.com's low-cost pricing was binding. Now, uh, this meant um, that after four years of allowing Jet2.com to operate, some flights outside of normal business hours. It was a breach of best endeavors, uh, endeavors clause for the airport to just suddenly say that, oh, you're no longer to allow, you're no longer allowed to do that. An important thing to note uh, is the fact that the term had been given meaning to in a contract that had actually been operating, again, like the uh, contract in Hillard, right? So these contracts were also been in operation. Uh, and in Jet2.com, specifically in this case, it was in operation for four years already. So this was an important consideration in these two cases. <clears throat> uh, 
All right. Now let's we discuss vague agreements, and um, we are still on the topic of certainty. Uh, and now we are going to discuss incomplete agreements. <clears throat> so the general rule. General rule is that the courts will not enforce an agreement which is missing essential elements. That's your general rule, the rule there. Okay. And the first case, uh, a key case uh, with regard to this rule is May and Butcher. Okay. The House of Lords <clears throat> in this case held that the agreement was incomplete at the time of its creation as it lacked a price and payment schedule. Okay. So the argument ran that if you had asked the buyer and the board uh, how much they would pay and receive and when, they would not have been able to tell you, right? Because there was no price schedule. It was accepted that an agreement may leave something to be determined in the future, for instance, uh, by a third party and still be certain, but it must not rely upon the parties coming to an agreement in the future. So on the facts, uh, the complete agreement could not be made to work because it contained an agreement for the parties to agree the price at a later date. Okay, so this kind of an agreement is called an agreement to agree. So the courts held that it was an incomplete agreement. If the if the parties uh, have an agreement to agree at a later date. This, all right. And uh, the principle in May, uh, May and Butcher versus the King that we just discussed um, is that an agreement to agree is unenforceable, and it was reaffirmed by Lord Denning in. The next case that you see on the slide, which is um, Courtney and Fairbairn Limited versus Tulane Brothers. Now, here the parties agreed to negotiate fair and reasonable contract sums to pay for the construction to work to be done. For the construction work to be done. The construction contract was incomplete and void for uncertainty because the price was to be agreed between the parties at a later date. So this, this case also has the same kind of effect as me and Butcher. Again, parties had an agreement to agree at a later date. So it was held to be unenforceable because it was incomplete and it was, uh, um, and it was void for uncertainty. So they said that it did not exist. The contract did not exist. So your general rule for incomplete agreements come from these two cases. <clears throat> okay, uh, another important point um, to come out of May and Butcher relates to the interpretation of Section 8 of Sales of Goods Act 1979. So please look at Section 8 uh, of Sales of Goods Act 1979 on the slide. <clears throat> okay, so this this Sales of Goods Act regulates the sales of goods. Goods means things, okay? such as televisions, cars, other physical objects. Um, so these are all things that are, related, uh, that are regulated by Sales of Goods Act. <clears throat> Does anyone know um, the predecessor of this act? Does anyone know what was the predecessor of this Sales of Goods Act, 1979? Let's see. 